Anyway, good morning, everybody. Good morning. If you've uh, had a chance to get outside today and look out at the um, at, at today's weather, it is just gorgeous. I mean, really, we are all in this room here, and we uh, we all agree that it's a beautiful day outside. And so, I hope that everyone at uh, at home, if you're if you're somewhere indoors, then I hope that you're you're soon able to get outside and to see this beautiful weather. But it's absolutely just stunning. Anyway, um, go ahead and pull over your uh, class docs repository. We have some new stuff to look at. Um, I think that we got some. I think we've got some interesting things to do. In fact, your slides are going to be this slide here. We're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to be ch uh, shifting our gears um, um, because we, we've just had our test. And by the way, the test is still open until Thursday. And so, if you haven't yet taken your test, uh, please don't forget. Um, it will probably take you about two hours. And so, find a block of time between. Now, and I think it's tomorrow morning at, what did I say, it's 10.50 or something, I think it's due, or 10, 10, 10.40, I think. I think it's actually, it's, it's, it must be 10.40. Anyway, it, it will say on Sakai, but get your test done by that time, because otherwise when it's finished, I can't bring it back. It's, that's a Sakai thing. So please do get the test done if you haven't done it. Um, anyway, but the thing is that we're, we're shifting gears um, a little bit, and what we're doing is we're going to talk about um, actually something that I find quite interesting. Um, I've actually written a paper on this, and the paper that I wrote, one of them, is in your uh, class docs repository now. Um, we'll go through that um, later on. But basically, this is called sequencing and assembly. And so uh, we're basically asking ourselves today, um, we have all this information that we're working with. We have like we're working with genomes, we're working, we're working with genes, we're working with DNA. And we ask ourselves, well, where does this data come from? And so that's really what we're talking about. Like, how do we get DNA data from a biological organism into our computers? But before we do that, let's just go back and talk about the genome here. And so, like, let's go back and actually discuss, like, why do we need this data? Why is data from DNA so in incredibly important? Um, that is because, um, Everything that's, uh, you know, a, a genome is actually, it, it, is, is all the, the, the genetic information that an organism has. It's everything. It's genes, it's regulatory regions, it's the, you know, the non-coding regions, it's, it's the, um, the promoters, it's every single thing that you would have in your genetics. And so if you have someone's genome, then you have the, the I guess, the, the possibility of, of studying seemingly all of their genetics. Now, whether or not the technology exists or the theory exists to study that effectively, that could be, you know, that's up in the air. But if you have that DNA, then you have the ability to study all of this, every single thing that has anything to do with the inheritance of genetic material or genetics in that, in that organism. So it's the complete set of instructions. This is actually kind of interesting. Morning. This is actually kind of interesting here. This is talking about, like, if you have the genetic content for individuals, um, how much of that content in bacteria, uh, fungi, um, protists, plants, insects, mollusks. Uh, how much of this stuff do you, how much, how much uh, code in DNA is actually coding or non-coding? Um, you can see that from this graph, it's kind of an unusual way. There's a bunch of other things that are going on in this, in this particular graph. But what this is saying that is that if you're an organism which is located on the left-hand side, then most of your DNA is, is for making genes, it's, or for, it's for making proteins. It's genes, it's uh, content that produces protein products. Whereas if you are an organism that's found on the right-hand side of this, it's saying that much of your genetic content is not necessarily for making protein, but it could be for other stuff. Um, it's not junk DNA, by the way. If you read um, biology textbooks from the 1990s to the early 2000s, um, they, uh, they talk about something called junk DNA, and junk DNA is is likened in these books to the clutter that's in your basement. Basically, it's stuff that's that's been left behind from like you know years and years and years, and nobody's come along to pick it up and move it because it really wasn't in anyone's way. And so they're saying that uh, that a lot of DNA kind of accumulates in the same way. But actually, more recent thinking is that just because you have these organisms here which have a lot of non-coding DNA or so-called junk DNA, it does not mean that that that, that DNA is is completely without use. In other words, um, there is no such thing as junk DNA. The DNA could be used as a, maybe a spacer, for instance. So when the so when the, the DNA wraps up on the uh, on the on the you know on itself here, then the the um, you're more likely to not to have the the pieces of the gene get get pinched as they wrap around other parts of the DNA. Who knows? But it's not junk, and so you have a lot of DNA in, in some of these more complicated organisms. I'll say complicated, but 
um, but they're more complicated, uh, such that uh, you can your your folding is not going to necessarily damage the the the, the, you know, the the code. At least that's one of the theories. There are many other theories. Um, so we ask ourselves, like, what's in a genome here? Well, the inside a genome, these are the numbers of genes in the genome, and this is actually extraordinary. Actually, this chart here led to several. Um, panic attacks and nervous breakdowns in uh, many prominent uh, geneticists back in the back in the 19s, I think in the 70s and 80s and 90s, when they were beginning to realize how many exactly how many genes did people have in comparison to other organisms. Um, you see this um, Arabidopsis thalania, which is about 20,000 genes. That's a kind of a flower, and you see this other one here called C. elegans. See, that's a kind of a worm. And so they have about, I'm going to say, about 20,000 genes in the flower and the worm. And at the very, very bottom here, we have Homo sapiens, which has about 20,000 genes. Now, the reason why people had panic attacks and nervous breakdowns is because they thought, well, since we're people, we probably have like many, many millions of millions of millions of more genes than, than any organism because we are so special. But actually, though, we were about the same as anybody else, and that's because we're built out of the same stuff. I mean, a worm, C. elegans, they live in a different environment than us. Um, you know, they, what, or do they? They live in, in a moist environment, but they're still made out of you know, proteins and uh, cells, and they have similar kinds of eukaryote cells that we do. And so they, they are, in some senses, very similar. It's just that their lifestyle is a little bit different. And so this kind of a test, or is a, a kind of a testament to how similar all life is on this planet, and that is that we're all built out of basically the same stuff. And so to build that stuff, and when I'm saying stuff, I mean proteins. When we're to build those proteins, you need the same kinds of genes, and that is why the work in you know, when you're looking at, at genomes is, is I find so riveting, so exciting, because you'll find, hey, this little worm thing, the C. elegans, we have the same gene. Cool. <laughs> So next time someone calls you a, a lazy worm, you say, thank you. <laughs> or, or not, you know, take it as you like. <laughs> I just say thanks. That's right, I am, I'm fine with that. Okay, so, so here we have the, uh, so, so we're, we're working with genomes here, and these are some of the, the discoveries that genomes have actually, or that, that um, geneticists and um, bioinformaticians have been able to find by analyzing genomes. And so remember, the genome projects that we see here are basically to determine you know, what's inside the organism and how can we uh, maybe look at some of the pieces of that, of that genome, find out like, you know, how the, what, the gene, or what, the, you know, what are the genes, what, are they, what, are they, what do they do, what order are they in. We're, that's really one of the things that we do in bioinformatics. And that allows us to find out how related things are or how perhaps different things are. But also, but it helps us to find out how life works. And so we use this word here called annotate. And by having a genome, you're able to annotate that genome, which means you're able to go through and find out you know, where are the protein coding regions. And we've actually done this in this class. We, would, we used BLAST. Um, we were able to compare genes that we knew with genes that we didn't know. I mean, we were able to see, we said that we know this is a gene of some kind, but we don't really know what it does. And then we found that this gene exists in other organisms or somebody else has found out that this gene is a, you know, it does a, makes a specific protein. Um, but the thing is, though, that since we found that out, now we know that that gene also exists in this first organism. And so we're able to kind of create a roadmap of this organism's genetics and to say this, at this part of the roadmap, there is a, a, a gene and it must do this. And so that means that if, it, if it has this job in this other organism, it must have this same job or a similar job um, in the organism that I'm looking at now. Um, and you can see these projects, in fact, um, this, is, this number has to be updated, I'm sure. Over 15,000 genome projects in progress were completed. <laughs> that number um, was actually from last year. It's probably up to, I mean, twice that by now. It seems that getting or you know, sequencing genes, we're actually finding genetic content, um, is becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper um, every day. It's like it's becoming, the technology is becoming so automated um, that it's, it's Every time you discover some new organism, and, and I think I heard somewhere that we have discovered on this planet like one percent of all organisms in the rainforest. It's like we've, we've, there are so many things out there that we haven't discovered yet, like different types of mosses, lyca, plants, uh, animals. It seems like all these different things. Uh, and so every time someone discovers one of these organisms, you're first to sequence that gene or to get get a copy of that that DNA. And so you have all these projects which are 
getting a copy of that, of that DNA or actually determining what the DNA code looks like um, as a string. And the thing is, though, you wouldn't just be doing new organisms, but you might say, well, here's a COVID variant here um, that I discovered um, in California. What does this thing look like? Like, what are the, what's the actual code or the COVID code? So I can see whether this is a different variant from something that's already in California. So <clears throat> a lot of things that people do is uh, genomes for is they try and see how, how these are just people here, but you can use this for any organism. You're trying to find out like how are people different in different parts of the world? Like how are, um, is there something, is there, are there genes that, that cater to like maybe uh, South American or um, maybe African groups which are differently expressed in other kinds of people or different other kinds of organisms? And if you look at certain types of, of, of birds, for instance, uh, you'll find that they are, there are genes that, that are still the same, but they're basically kind of, uh, I guess, alleles of each other in some senses because they are slightly different. They do slightly different things and they have a slightly different behavior, but the gene is still there. It's, it's, still, uh, it's still the same thing. But you can still find out where these genes are by, by studying all these people and say, well, thing in this organism, which is found all over the world, is at this region here. What we're looking at down here, actually, is when I'm looking at this area right here, um, this is this bottom thing is actually the uh, the roadmap of the piece of DNA that we're looking at. It's like you're just going through the DNA piece by piece by piece, uh, like you know, as a giant line here, and kind of like just scooting through with, with, a, with a window that's open, and you're kind of like scooting through the DNA, and you're looking at things. And these red places are actually these annotations. They are known protein product genes. That means that somebody used BLAST or, have, or some other type of analysis, but probably BLAST was included there. And they said, I'm finding this section of, of code here, which looks a lot like a section of code that I've seen before, in another, which was a gene. And so, of course, they used BLAST and they verified that actually enough of this, this code in this common region is the same. So therefore, it probably was a gene. And then, of course, more research followed where they were looking to see whether that gene actually does behave as the genes in other organisms. And so these are what they call um, annotations. And hopefully you've discovered those by now on your own, uh, but they are um, actually when you click around uh, in NCBI and you click on the, um, if, if you click on the, the, you know, the genome for some, for some of the, well, actually I think for all of them, but if you click on a, in a, you know, the, the genome accession number in a record, um, you'll probably find eventually after clicking, you'll find something that looks like this, which is the annotations. And of course, when you click on a gene, uh, you can find that this is actually a, a type of a protein. And in this case here, this is arbitrary, but you can see that, that the title is a sugar ABC transporter substrate binding protein. That means that somebody has found out that at this location of 6,823 to 8,445, somebody has found out that that particular location in the, or in the organism's genome was a gene, and that was using BLAST. And so it is for that reason why we spent so much time talking about BLAST, because BLAST, I would say, is one of those technologies which is at the heart of, of, um, of many of the research projects that, that is done in, in bioinformatics. It's not the only thing, it's one of many, but I would say that many projects begin with BLAST. And you can see even here, you have this BLAST button down here uh, on, this, um, on this, this protein, and that's to do a protein BLAST to find out well, what, where else have we seen this protein showing up in nature? Can we learn something about the same protein in other, in other organisms from here? So anyway, I'm really talking about like we're studying genetic variation by looking at these genomes. And you can see, for instance, we can study something called the genetic drift, which is actually something that's quite exciting. Uh, genetic drift is, is, uh, is, uh, is basically the aging of an organism as a result of evolutionary pressures. So um, a, a case in point would be that um, organisms that, um, that, uh, that live in the uh, Yellowstone's like super hot uh, springs, uh, there are organisms that live there. They live in these, these high extreme environments, high temperature extreme environments. And then, I mean, there's, there's bacteria that live there and they don't die. Any other bacteria like, you know, E. coli or something would die in these extreme temperatures, but, but not this stuff. They live there. Um, and so the thing is, though, that a, that, was a, that was a result of some kind of genetic drift where at one time the bacteria wasn't an organism, I mean, it, sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't an organism that lived there, but then it took up residency in these hot springs and then it began to change itself, evolve itself, so that it was able to survive in these, 
in these super hot springs. And that's what they call genetic drift. It's like, you, it's like it, it happened. It was a result of some environmental pressure, and, and then, they be, then these organisms moved into this, uh, were able to kind of you know, meet the challenge and then survive in spite of that challenge. And that's what your drift is. So these are like what they call evolutionary pressures that are causing a change in a species. Now, this isn't to say that the whole species met that same genetic drift, but a part of it did, and the other part didn't. So the part that moved into the springs survived in the in Yellowstone, whereas the the the, the um, you know the relations of that of that uh, bacteria that did not move into the spring uh, did not meet the challenge. In fact, today, if you take a if you took a you know maybe a, a sample of the other types of organisms and dumped them into the springs, it would just be too hot for them, and they'd probably just die. So we're comparing two different environmental kinds of, you know, you know, or organisms from two different environments to determine like how they are different. How did the drift? How did this drift affect them? And again, that's using this, these genomes. Another thing that we can compare, and this is actually kind of sometimes hard to, to look at, but there is there are some very specific types of ailments that are that are affecting people. There's one called the Habsburg jaw, which was um, which was this typical uh, large chin that was that was shown in the Habsburg's uh, family history in, in, in Europe. That was a result of a lot of basically, um, I don't want to say inbreeding, but it was inbreeding. Um, you know, the genes were kind of being, you know, the genes, or the, the gene that, that was resulting, that resulted in that, in that, that long or elongated jaw um, were meeting some kind of um, ch environmental ch or um, evolutionary challenge, which was, you know, the family kept having you know, children between cousins and things. There wasn't any new genetic material coming into the, the family's gene pool, and so certain traits like the long jaw and and the, the pronounced jawbone uh, became very um, prominent. Another one is called the Ellis Van Creveld syndrome, which is where you have a sixth finger, which is a, another result of types of inbreeding. And so in communities where no new genes are coming in, that's a kind of an evolutionary pressure for some of the former genes. Uh, they are not. Uh, they're trying to, or they're not. They're not being. You know, they're 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 digressing, and that basically means in this case that the maybe the recessive alleles or the recessive genes are becoming the dominant uh, genes. Ultimately, it's a very serious thing, and um, many of these problems you'll find happen in types of communities of organisms, people included, which might live in certain types of cutoff habitats where you can't find. You can't get populations to, to, to breed except for you know, if they're very, very closely related already. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is the Madagascar uh, lemur, which is this little furry uh, squirrel like creature that lives, uh, that, it's a nocturnal creature that lives in Madagascar because of like, you know, changing of the, changing of the, um, the environment and, or changing of their habitat, they're becoming, their, their forests where they live are becoming um, kind of cut apart by, by building projects. And so you have a forest over here and another forest over here, which used to be one giant forest, but now it's two separate forests, and there's this, this rift of land between them. And so now these lemurs are unable to, 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 you know, to breed with each other, and so that means that the, um, you have certain types of inbreeding that occur in, in communities of lemurs, and that creates problems in lemur um, genetics, such that you have these recessive disorders which now become dominant disorders. And that's, that's an, a kind of genetic drift. And so genetic drift is not always good, but the thing is, we're studying this from our data. It's like we're able to see that genetic drift is happening because we have data. And so really what we're talking about today is how do I know that, um, that genetic drift is actually happening? How do I know that there's something going on with my organism? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so what we're talking about is we know that we have this genetic drift because we're able to get the DNA. And the DNA we get from a technology called genome sequencing, or it's assembly. You might call it assembly, but genome sequencing. And that is where you're... Basically, you're, you're going into the cell, you're grabbing some DNA, you pull that DNA out, and you put it into a special, um, I guess, an environment where you're able to, you know, to, to work with it and cut it up into tiny, 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 tiny pieces. I mean, you have to do that. You have to cut it up into pieces. And like a jigsaw puzzle, you have a, an automated system put those pieces back together, but when it puts those, when your automated system puts those pieces back together, this time it makes a note of what order those pieces went in. And that's how you create your genome. And so we're gonna talk about that today. <laughs> and so this is, your, this is one of your, your genome sequencing machines. This is the, where it all begins. This chart that we see down at the bottom is actually kind of trendy. In fact, I wouldn't mind having a t-shirt that just had this, this design on, on there. 
But what it is is a, um, this is from a gene machine, and a gene machine or a sequencer um, takes a sample of, of, of DNA, like the actual, you know, the actual mucus-like stuff, takes a sample of that, and it runs it through a series of tests and things, and there's a whole technology that, that follows. But the upshot, though, is that it goes through and it figures out where the where A's, T's, G's, and C's are, and that's done by these 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 microplots. And so, for instance, you can see that T, T, G, T, T, A, T. These are all. Um, this is a microplot of of. Uh, they find that thymines were, were 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 at that location because when they shined a special thymine light, if you will, on that DNA at that particular uh, location, thymine was the only thing that reflected some some kind of signal back. G, for instance, again, when they when they were, when they when they shine their their light, if you will, I keep saying light, but it's actually some other stuff too. But basically, it's a, that kind of system. When, you, when you're shining, when you're doing a test at that particular location, uh, the only signal you get is G, and then again, they get the only the only signal you get following this is T, and then T, and now the signal becomes A, and you and, and that's how you know that the A is following the T. But the actual how you read that though is by these microplots, and I mean obviously some person doesn't have to do this work anymore. They used to, but a machine does this, and it figures out where the peaks are, and it says, well, here, since I see this green <clears throat> peak right down here, that must indicate that that's an A, and that green peak is following this red peak, which indicates it was a T. In uh, a PhD program <clears throat> back in like the 19, what was it? I guess in like the 1980s or 70s or something, I actually, I met somebody who got their PhD, I think in 1978 in biology. And I said, that's, that's exciting. How did you, what, what did you, what was your, your thesis topic? And they said that they were, their, 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 their thesis topic uh, was to sequence a gene. They spent five years to sequence a gene. And they, they did it just like this on your screen by, by actually going through manually and running each test for each of these sequenced pieces and then determining from these microplots that they had to create themselves what the sequence was. I said, oh. That seems like something that, uh, and, I, uh, and then he finished the sense like something that a machine would do today. You're right, but that technology had to come from somewhere. So that was that was his work, which is very exciting. I think that was actually, I mean, it's a very cool idea to to be able to say I went through and I saw a gene with my own eyes and I figured the whole thing out. Anyway, so the bases are recorded as these little peaks, <clears throat> but here's a new vocabulary for you to look at. Here we have reads and contigs. Now reads are basically small, tiny, 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 um, uh, you know, uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces of this, of, this, um, of this genetic code. So in other words, when these machines work, by the way, they don't produce like, you know, all this code in one long line here. It's not like it says, that, okay, beginning of the gene, downloading, and then you have all the code that comes through. But rather what happens is um, the machine will give you, it just picks up randomly in this pool of, of all these, uh, of this, DNA, just a piece that's been sliced up, and it says, this is the piece I found, this is the code that it is, it's 20 bases long, here you go, I'll put this in my database. And the next one I found was 40, and it has this. The next one I found was three. The next one I found was two. The next one I found was 10. So like it, it's just grabbing pieces in the, <clears throat> in the, um, the, in the liquid of, of shredded DNA, that's, that's how you, and then this is how it works. I mean, what I should say is, you're grabbing DNA, and it comes out, and you have to shred it up so the machine can work with it. And then it just grabs piece by piece by piece, whatever it happens to be floating around, and then it will give you that particular code, which is like this. And so that's called a read. These are the jigsaw puzzle pieces that you have to put back together uh, to build your whole sequence. Now, reads are combined to make contigs. Contigs become larger and larger pieces. Everybody knows that when you're putting together a jigsaw puzzle piece, um, it's actually much easier to start with putting smaller pieces together and making bigger kind of clumps, and then to figure out where those bigger clumps go in relation to the whole jigsaw puzzle. And so the contigs are those combined reads or the bigger clumps. <clears throat> so the sequencing operation basically is, is this. this is, there's a lot of science that goes into this. And so I'm kind of, I'm kind of glossing over some of the, is the issues. But you're, um, you're, you grab a piece of DNA, yeah, and when I say grab a piece of DNA, you're actually grabbing like hundreds and thousands of copies of DNA from some organism. So you have to have a bunch of DNA from that organism. It has to be shredded up into little pieces, like you see here. And it's really what you're doing is you're, you're cloning perhaps the DNA. But it has, then you shred it up into, into little pieces like, like this down here. And then you have your, you have 
your automation, um, find each of these pieces, and then kind of catalog them, say this is a piece I found, and a piece I found, this is what it looks like, and so on and so forth. And then you have to put everything together like a jigsaw puzzle. And when you put everything together, you're really just taking note and saying, this is the sequence, I found this sequence, sequence number, whatever the number was that, I, that it happened to be. And I found that that one went first, and then I found the next one went second and third and fourth. And then as you put it back together, you're actually able to build a string, basically a string, um, of the DNA code itself. So let me just take you through a little journey here. This is kind of a fun little thing. Um, but imagine, though, that um, you know Charles Dickens, he wrote The Tale of Two Cities, a, a very long book, which, by the way, if you read this book, it might take you several months to finish. Um, it has many, many words in this book. Um, in this book, and by the way, the reason why the, the the Tale of Two Cities book is so long is because Charles Dickens was paid by the word, and so he was probably not going to miss any opportunities to put every single word that he possibly could into that into that book, and so it's very wordy. And so, but imagine that he cuts the whole thing up, or he shreds it like this guy here, and just breaks it up into pieces, and uh, he's um, and he thinks to himself, you know, how am I supposed to put this whole thing back together? If I I've, if I've shredded my book by mis by mistake. Um, how am I supposed to put everything back together again? And by shredding, what I'm saying is that you have all the words themselves have basically been kind of, like, there's like clumps of words. It's not like there's just one word by one word, but it's like clumps of the sentences have been kind of cut and you know, lacerated and, and then kind of thrown to the floor. And so we have all this, this pile of, of words and pieces of words and pieces of sentences, which used to be the tale of two cities or tale of two cities here. So we ask ourselves, um, how do we put these fragments back together to form a book? Um, this is really what it will look like here. If you put these fragments together in some kind of sense of a, like in the sense of a, of a jigsaw puzzle, you'll see that they do actually come together. And each of these blocks here is like, you know, it's probably off here, but I should, I should move this, um, these boxes around. But what I'm saying there is that you're, when you put them back together, it does create the story. But individually, if you look at one of these blocks by itself, like this one in the middle here, um, this would, I would just see like, um, can I just, uh, this is like all I get inside this block. And so by itself, just looking at this block, um, you really get no information about what's going on there, you know, what, what it's like, how it goes into the rest of, the, of the, the rest of the sentence. But when you start getting more and more pieces of these sentences and, and putting them together, then you can start making sense of this text. <clears throat> and that's where this is, that's where we're going with this whole thing. And so, here we have, um, in this case, uh, we're working with five different copies of his book, and we have all these different words all over the place. And so the thing is that five different copies, and that, that means that um, we have uh, five books that were shredded. They're all, I mean, they're all shredded slightly differently, but you will have like this piece of text comes from five different books. Now, how it's been cut is, is anyone's guess. You might find that, for instance, you might find that in, in one book, the cut was just this, these, the first two words, it was. Maybe in another book here, you might find this, these two words here, the best. Maybe in, a, in another book, you might find the whole line is here. But what I'm saying, though, is that you have the words, but you just don't know what order they, they come in. And that's why things are so difficult. So all these, the, the most important thing to re, uh, remember here is that all these fragments are mixed together, just like in this picture at the bottom here. They're all mixed together. And so, yes, technically, you, you do have the information, um, but you have no idea what the order was, and so maybe that isn't information after all. So this is really what it looks like. In fact, um, I can take, I'm gonna show you something. Um, I've given you in your, in your class docs, there's a file called 15 secret line uh, demo or challenge, I forget what I called it, but it should be in your um, class docs repository. Uh, what it is, is a, um, uh, you can actually, I'll just show you. It's the same as, well, let's go through this first. But you can actually play with this. So these are all the words from Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. And so what we're gonna do is we just grab, we start with maybe one thing, like one of the words at the top of the list here. Um, the best of times or the, you know, we just, we just grab this, this text. We have no idea really where it goes. We're just arbitrarily grabbing that. And then we're trying to figure out its placement in the rest of the sentence here. And so then we grab other types of, of, uh, of sequences of these uh, from this text. And we try and kind of align these things to figure out how this stuff went together. Now, what we're doing though is we, we're doing what's called the uh, we're looking for a, a you know some kind of um, identity across these uh, these these reads. These are reads from a um, from this book. But the idea though is that we're saying, you know that that on the top it says here the best of times, 
it. And then on the bottom here, we know best of times, whoops, best of times it was. Now, we're going to guess that the full sentence is the best of times, comma, it was. Because if you put one thing on top of the other like this, you'll see that this stuff in the middle is the same. So therefore, it suggests that the word the best of times it may be followed by was because you know these are we have these reads. Now, let me just say something that these reads come from two different books. They're not the same book. And so that's how we're, we're, we're working here. So we keep on going like this. It was the best of times. If you have the best of times, the best of times, best of times. And then we have this word it, and then we have another one, best of times it was. One of the things that you have to think about though is, could it be that the you know, best of times, that expression was listed as a, um, in, in more than one place in this book? So in other words, yes, these words do line up, but actually this is not the one that goes here. And, and so the, word, the next word is not was. So you keep on going here, I and mean, we're just gonna assume that this is correct here. We're trying to find the, the largest overlap between these words. The best of times, I mean, that's actually a large overlap. The best of times, four words. If you had like another word, like the word the, the word the appears, it's an article, it appears everywhere. And so that isn't a very long or very big overlap. Yes, you can find that words do overlap with the word the, but that doesn't mean that those, those sentences actually do, uh, th those words themselves actually go in that order. So here we are again, we keep on going, and then we find there's another a sequence here where it's in red, where we have, by some miraculous, um, something happened here, something miraculous happened, where each book, these are two different books here, they were cut up in the same way. Or maybe they, were come, maybe they come from the same book. All we know is that we have five books in the, in the pot here, and we have these reads here. So we don't know actually whether those, if those came from different books or whether they came from the same book. Could it be that Charles Dickens wrote Of Times It Was The in two different places? If I did a search of Charles Dickens' book and I did a search for Of Times It Was The as an exact sequence search, could I find that in multiple places? I could. It's not a very long, sta not a very long statement. And so maybe, maybe he did write that in other places. And so we just put them here. In our, in, our, in our jigsaw puzzle <coughs> that we're working, <coughs> and, we, and we find out kind of, you know, that well, this, we live in the here for now, but we, we suggest that the overlap is good enough or rich enough that the next word is the word the. And so if you look at the actual, ten, the actual sentence that we're building, hopefully by now you're remembering your high school English class where you read A Tale of Two Cities, where it began, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the age of bioinformatics, it was not the age of bioinformatics. I just made that up. <laughs> well, what I'm saying though, it, this is one sentence, everybody. Let me just say something that if you're writing, if you, if you write your, your comp this way, you're going to lose points. And I can tell you that you're going to lose points because this is one sentence. This is too much. I, my brain doesn't work that way. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but you get an idea about how these words are coming together because you're building this thing. You're building, you're putting things together piece by piece by piece. And after a while, when you have looked at this thing long enough, you start to realize that actually I can see how the rest of the sentence is coming together. You're making sense of it. And you keep going. And the repeats will pile up. Sure, you'll get more and more repeats here. And you just keep, have, you, have to, you have to do something with them. So I think that you tend to like leave them here for now. Um, just because you don't have any evidence to, to suggest that they don't belong there. Uh, but also, though, you have, um, you have some ambiguity that, that shows up here. That's what I was talking about before, where you have the word times it was the. Times it was the. Over here, you see times it was the age, times it was the worst. Age and worst. This doesn't sound very optimistic, does it? But you can see that, going back to the sentence here, of times it was the of times it was them. And so the word worst and age are different, but the other stuff that comes before it is the same. And so you don't know whether it was, it was the best of times it was the worst of times it was the age of wisdom. You don't know whether it was the, I mean, you don't know whether it was the best of times it was the age of times it was the worst of wisdom. You have no idea really how that, that, that knowledge comes together. And it's for that reason that you have that, that, that uh, I guess you call that, that hang up. You see how you have this age and worst? It's, it's for that reason that you have different versions of, um, of genetic code. 
So for instance, you might find, as we discussed before, there's like you know, um, the um, bacteria genome point one. Then you find it's point two, then you find it's point three. And that's because some kind soul has come along and said, oh, you know what? Actually, I can tell you age and worst, they're in the wrong order. That's not how they go. And you say, well, how do you know that? And they said, well, I did some experimentation, and I found out that that comes from a gene, and that gene could not possibly be in that position in the, in the genome. So therefore, it has to be the other way around. You know, it, it cannot be. And so that's how the versions change. And so you get this constant updating of your data. And so then again, as we discussed before, you, the bioinformatician, have to decide whether should I rerun some of my analyses because the data has changed because they've worked. They've somebody has worked out that the the word age and worst were in the wrong order. So you have these notations you would add to your work here, where you're saying I'm not sure what exactly it was. I know that this is the sentence that that this part of the sentence here should be correct, but I have this. I have two different evidences that says that age and worst are. I hate to say that, agent worst. I should have found more optimistic words here. Aging is not the worst. I'll tell you. I don't want to make it seem like that is. But what I'm saying though is that you you have you have this this notation here, and so you really you're you're leaving this out, saying if anyone comes across this organism or anyone comes across this text, if you find any evidence that I missed to tell me whether worst comes before age or age comes before worst, in other words, what is the actual order of these pieces down here? Then please let me know, and I will change my record so that the so that yeah, and, and and change the version too, so that the you know the, the bioinformatics community has the most up to date information. So we, you do have this question that always comes back: which word do I use here? Which one is it? So that's a, that's really something that happens to me all the time. Let me just show you going back to um, let me just show you this that uh, hopefully I still have. Um, hopefully you can see this. So this is the file that you should have, sequence alignment challenge or something in, in, your, in, your, in your thing. But you can kind of get an idea about how you can play with this on your own. You can kind of move these pieces around and kind of, it was the best of times. It was the, no, that doesn't work at all. So hang on. It was the age, where's the age? It was the age, I'll just grab this one here. Uh, I can have to move it like this. So you can kind of, you can kind of like move these things around, but the whole point of this is that you could you could spend you know like an hour playing with this thing here, and you'll probably come up with several different reasons to believe that it was one way, but then you might have another couple of reasons to believe that it was another way. In other words, you're dealing with this problem of you know how the you know what what word went next, um, and so you will find that it's a very time consuming it's a very time consuming thing to do this. So you might find, for instance, this is a good I'll move this out of the way here, but you might find that over here uh, this is actually working out quite nicely because times it was the age, times it was the age of, of times it was the, and so you can kind of get an idea that in this, in this sense, I hope you can all see this, but in this sense here that maybe times went first and then age went second, but that's just arbitrary though, because I mean, this is when I, when I was working with this, when I was just playing with it just now, I happened to find evidence to suggest that this is the way it went, but you may find that there's evidence to suggest the opposite. And so then again, you have to go back and make sure that you know, you're, you're, you're doing some kind of research to determine what exactly is the order. So um, you can play with that and see what you think. And I'll tell you that if you work with that, you'll find that, that will take you a long time to put this together. And if you're working with, when you're working with English texts like this, I mean, then we can recognize that there is some kind of, you know, that we can, see, we can kind of, we're, we're not just playing with the numbers or the, sorry, the, we're not just playing with the characters anymore, but rather we're playing with maybe the intelligence behind the whole thing. We recognize the story, and so we're using that story to, to base our judgment. But the thing is though that when you're working with DNA, it just looks like random stuff. And so you, have, you need an algorithm that will actually take you through it and help you figure out what that sequence actually is. And so this is again the summarized uh, thing here. We, have our, we, have, we take our piece of DNA, we clone it you know, as many times as we possibly can, we, we cut it up, into as many little pieces as we possibly can. Those little pieces are then easy to work with in our, in our technology. The technology grabs each of these pieces, one by one by one, <coughs> figures out the genes, A's, T's, G's, and C's, it figures out, I mean, it figures out what they're, not the genes, but, but it figures out the orders of the, of the bases, and then we have to put them back together in this kind of system here. And once we have put everything back together, then we have a sequence at the very, very bottom. That we get when we go to NCBI. 
Now, this took a long time to do. A very, very, very long time to do. And it, it, it took like more time than, than it should have done. And so I can show you, um, for instance, the, let me just show you something here. If I can find my, if I can find my own paper here, that would be handy here. I have, oops, let me just get this out here and drop it in there. So this is a paper that actually I wrote with some, some colleagues when I was in graduate school. And um, what this paper is that, I mean, um, you don't have to, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time here taking a completely random approach to putting these jigsaw puzzle pieces together again. There are certain types of identifications that you can use, or landmarks, or statistical tools you can use to figure out, um, kind of make a, a, a rough guess for, well, was this piece in the beginning or was it the end? Remember the conversation that we had when we were talking about like the GC content and in the, in, in the DNA, I said that there are certain areas where you need more bonds than other areas that to, you know, to keep the DNA perhaps together. So you have the, your GC content, which has three bonds, and you have your AT content, which has two bonds. Well, you can actually use statistics like that uh, to infer where pieces may have belonged originally in the sequence when they've been cut up. In other words, you're looking at a jigsaw puzzle, and you're saying, here's a jigsaw puzzle picture of a lake in the foreground, so the water's blue, then I have like a sky in the background, which is like a, maybe a, a lighter color blue, and then I have some mountainous stuff on the side, and so that's maybe green. And so I'm kind of figuring out by looking at puzzle pieces, I have no idea where these pieces actually go individually, but based upon the color, I can say, well, this is light blue, so this puzzle piece must have something to do with the sky. This is a darker blue. This puzzle piece must have something to do with the water. This is a, a color of green. This puzzle piece was not the sky, it was not the water, but rather it was the it was the, the, the mountains. And so you're using this idea to kind of infer where these pieces could go, and so that will inform your system of thinking when you start putting together your, your reads. And so you're not going randomly here, but you have actual reason to believe that certain reads came from certain places. And when you're doing, this is like one of the most important pieces here, and that is that when you are actually doing uh, this work here, when you're, when you're sequencing genomes, um, many companies or many um, biology, biology labs here um, find that it's 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 just too expensive to do it, to go one by one. You can't go one by one with, with these things. In other words, you can't fire up the machine only to do one genome. But rather, what you do is you have maybe multiple genomes in the pool all together, and then you have to figure out which genome piece came from which which genome. So you have like maybe the yellow organism, and you have the pink organism, and then you have the green organism, and all of their genetic code is dumped together in this giant pool, and you're trying to figure out. Well, who came, or which piece came from which organism? Well, it turns out, and I'll just go to the results here, it turns out that you can look at these words that exist in those, when I say words, like you know, collections of bases, certain types of, of words that exist in certain organisms to infer what those, um, you know, you're, 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 to infer what that, where those, those, those sequences came from. So in other words, I'm grabbing the sequences, I'm looking at the content, I'm thinking, I find, oh, there's a whole bunch of Gs and Cs in here. I know that having lots of Gs and Cs is something that a bacteria typically has, but not this. Well, maybe, my, maybe I can organize my, my gene pool so I can say, well, actually, the, uh, genes, the Gs and Cs are a result of the, of the green organism. Who knows? And so this is a, a kind of a system here. It's just a pre-processing algorithm which goes very, very quickly and allows you to take all these different reads that you have in the pool and to kind of break them down statistically and figure out, well, this appears to be um, an organism that I've seen before. And let me just move forward in some of the results here. This is really how it works, where you're, you're, you're going through all the different motifs that exist here, and then you're adding some kind of, this is your, the algorithm, um, but you're, you're, you're looking at, the, you're looking at um, what's called the information that exists <clears throat> inside each of those reads, and you're comparing that information with the information from other organisms that you know uh, that, that you have. And you're saying that, for instance, I find a sequence here which has, and this is all information theory, which is a, a kind of mathematics. I can discuss more about that if you'd like to know more. But it, really what you're doing is you're looking at, the, at, the, you know, the, the, at the, the, the amount of information that's coming out of each sequence. Is it structured? Is it random? You know, what does it look like? And you're saying, well, I know that non-structured pieces of DNA are coming out of this organism here, so maybe this non-structured piece that I'm finding down here is from that other organism. And so you're really creating clusters in, in a sense here. And in fact, let me see here. You can't really see what this is. I, I, I should have made this a bit bigger. But these are different area. And if you look at the, the, the overall, these are words that exist 
if I can get this back now. Okay, these are different words that exist in, in DNA, and what you're doing is you're finding out that the colors indicate numbers. This is what they call a heat map. And so what you see in your heat map is that uh, blue colors are, in this over here, blue colors tend to or indicate, whoops, um, lower numbers than red numbers, or than red colors. So if you're red, you're higher. If you're blue, you're lower. And so this is basically a, a collection of numbers, which has been, um, like what Dr. Thu was saying in her, in her talk just last time, but you're using color to kind of determine um, values of things. And so I've clustered this work together. And you find, for instance, that um, you have clostridium and you have some other types of bacteria which all have different reliances on these words. And so I can use these words, these specific words in gene sequences and say, well, um, give me a random piece of gene uh, or a random sequence that I have for my sequencer and I'll see how many times this word appears in there or whether it appears there at all. And I'll use that as some kind of justification that it may have come from this type of organism and may it, it may have come from another kind of organism. So what this is really saying though, is that certain organisms like to build their genes in a specific way. Just like you and me and everybody else we know, we all have our own way of speaking. Um, I have uh, my neighbor, my gosh, my gosh, everything is my gosh. And so if I hear the word, my gosh, then I know, oh, that's obviously my neighbor speaking. And I never say that. I mean, I use other words, but that's just the way that that's how they express themselves. And so if somebody gives me a piece of text and I see the word, my gosh, in there, I'm going to assume that my neighbor wrote that because that's exactly how they speak. And so if you give me a, a gene sequence here and I find that, um, I'm trying to zoom in on this before my computer crashes. <laughs> and I find that I get T-A-A-T-A-T, -A -A -T, if I find that particular word that's at the very, very bottom, if I find that that's in abundance, like up here, for instance, let's see this bright red, I'm going to assume because I know that Clostridium really seems to like that word for some reason. And so that's really a, an interesting paper that I put together. There are many low-hanging fruit in this paper. I mean, there's, if you wanted to pick up this project and keep it going, then please do. It'd be, uh, it, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, 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 um, of there's, a lot to, there's a lot to discover. And this is only just the, 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 the name of the part of it here. This is another interesting result here where you can find that this organism down here, which is um, Burkholder, Burkholderia, um, Holdera, I guess Burkholdera, um, this particular organism doesn't have any of these words in them. The blue indicates, a, a, um, the dark blue of this color indicates zero to none, or you know, slim to none. And so that means that this organism doesn't use these words, whereas this organism in red here, Clostridium, does use these words. And so what I'm trying to say, getting back to this, this whole, if I can zoom out of this thing now, um, getting back to, these are some more heat maps you can look at, which actually are kind of, kind of cool to look at. Um, what, I'm, what I'm getting back to though is if, you, if, you, if you're getting back to this um, idea here where you're working with uh, sequencing genes, you're not actually working with, uh, you're not pulling genes out of, a, or sequences, the, uh, reads I guess I should say, read sequences out of a pot and trying to figure out you know, willy-nilly did it come from this organism or the other organism or wherever it is. How does this, where do these pieces come from? Well, what I'm saying is that you can use this technology from this paper and the information about where it could have come from though, based upon the information theory or the information content in certain types of organisms. Um, and that's basically saying, I know that there are three organisms in this pot, I can figure out based upon how they build their genes, what the sequences were likely to be. And that's actually kind of cool. This was, um, <laughs> not that I'm tooting my own horn here, but I had actually a couple of people from the Air Force um, come out and listen to this, listen to my presentation when I presented this from Nebraska, the Nebraska Air Force at Stratcom. And they came out, they listened to it, and they said, oh, that's a, you keep this up, son. And I thought, oh my God, that's so exciting. And they said, yeah, you keep this up, son. <laughs> nice, cool, nice. Okay, then moving on to the things here. So the next thing we have to talk about, though, is we're talking about putting these jigsaw puzzle pieces together. We have nine minutes to get this thing through. We'll probably not get this all done today. We'll probably have to come back on Friday. <coughs> but when you have all these reads here, there's a, there's a number of different softwares that actually do this work for us, that figure out how pieces come together. And so this random short sequence reads, that's the stuff over here. The algorithm actually is this arrow, which you see in the very center. And what it does is it puts the pieces back together based upon overlap. Now we're gonna talk about overlap in a bit here, so I'm gonna gloss over things for a second. 
But overlap is really saying find the longest chunk of code, which is, which is common to two different sequences, and base that on the idea that or base the idea that that's the sequence direction, or that's the, or that's the, that's what the, or those, those two pieces somehow were were found area of text or something. Now they're, they, they're, that's how you're supposed to be able to figure out what's going on. One of the problems, though, um, that I haven't mentioned, and this is something that really confuses, um, is that let me just look at this this code right here. Um, I have a t g, or sorry, a t c g g a. One problem they have to work with and why you need computational tools is because you have no idea whether that's backwards. Is that A, G, G, C, T, A. And so you have a bunch of other tests, and again, I'm glossing over things, to actually confirm that that was probably A, T, C, G, G, A was probably the way that it went. That was probably the, the direction. But this number one above this that we see here, I'm trying to zoom in here with my computer, just barely able to keep up. One means that of all the, the sequences that I found and I put them all together in a, in a jigsaw, I only have one character as an, um, you know, to, at, in that column. But over here, when I have two, I see that I have a C and I have another C down here to suggest that two is, uh, I have like basically two pieces of evidence to say that that's the second character. And you can see that three, I have three sequences where I have a G, a G, and a G to suggest that those those, that G was probably, was probably there. And so that's part of this backwards or forwards thing. If it, is it A, T, C, G, G, A? Or was it G, or so A, G, G, C, T, A? Well, again, you have this, this coverage proof here. We're saying, well, I don't really know exactly, but I'm gonna guess that it works out nicely. I have more coverage, or I have more, I have more evidence to believe that, that G, 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 you know, from these three, these three sequences here, that was toward the end of this first read here, or that read, this, this read G, uh, A, T, C, G, G, A, that seems to work out, when I put this piece in it this particular way, I get more overlaps. And so it's kind of like a greedy algorithm. But as you go through, you'll find that this uh, one, two, two, three, two, two, three, 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 over here, this is kind of a, it's a kind of a, a sense of how sure are you who it is what it should be. So in here, for instance, where you have this one in the middle, um, maybe in super long genomes, having a one right there doesn't really prove anything. I mean, maybe you find that, that there's a one here, but that doesn't tell you much, and that's, there's not much evidence to suggest that this value is a C. I mean, if, imagine, for instance, that you didn't have this, this long word right here, but rather you had maybe another shorter word, and you had one as the overlap, or one, one as a result of the overlap. And so one isn't, isn't super high, but I'd say that when you have like a, a number one, which is tucked between larger numbers like this, maybe that's okay, but for instance, when you are starting out, and you have like one, one, like over here, this one, one, um, you, uh, you, have, you, have no, you have no idea whether, for instance, these numbers are 100% are accurate because there's no information on the left-hand side of this one, one. So I'm thinking that you, you kind of get the problem now, and so this is why we need computers. That's why bioinformatics is taught in computer science. Um, you know, for these kinds of things, because a computer is really the only thing that's able to kind of work through all these hundreds of millions, I mean, literally hundreds of millions of fragments of DNA, go through them piece by piece by piece by piece, and figure out what order they came in. This reminds me, I recently watched a, um, if you guys if you were, if you watched that show on, on Netflix called uh, the, the Blacklist with Raymond Reddington or something. Yeah. There was one episode, I've only seen it like three times, but there's one episode that I did see where he and his, he's a, he's a gangster or something, and so he breaks into someone's office, it's a good show by the way, but he breaks into someone's office and he steals these shredded documents so that he can, um, he can show that there's some kind of conspiracy going on. I mean, he's, a, he, he's the protagonist here. He's the good guy. And so he steals these shredded documents from someone's office and he is able to put them back together and, sh and show some missing evidence to the FBI and prove the point and save the day and do good for the community. Uh, and so what, what, what he did though is he used exactly this same technology here where the shredded documents were actually these little chunks of, of code and he was able to use an algorithm like an assembly algorithm just like this and to look at the threads and try and figure out how they would go back together based upon their overlapping um, natures, like whether they would, if there's any like, you know, or they're, I guess they're, they're using probability too to figure out does it seem likely this piece was next to this other piece. But basically, it's in there. When you see that episode, you'll recognize it as, as, as this, this kind of technology. 
So um, we have to find, first of all, the largest overlap. Now, there's a kind of a rule of thumb that you use here, kind of a general overall rule. How do I know that I'm actually finding the, 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 the overlap? Well, let us consider that we're looking at two fragments. I call them fragments here, not reads or contigs, because I mean, it's the same if you're working with, uh, with the reads, which are the short pieces, or the contigs, which are the larger pieces of combined reads. The contigs are big. Um, you just call them fragments here. But really what you're doing though is you're looking to see whether um, is there some area in each of these two sequences for which there is some common code. And is it at the beginning or is it is usually at the beginning of one thing or the end of another thing or maybe it's somehow embedded. In. If you have a sequence where another, a shorter sequence is actually embedded inside that sequence, it doesn't really give you much information. But if you have a sequence, for instance, where you have one thing over here and another thing over here, and you find that there's like this, 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 um, this common chunk between the end of one sequence and the beginning of the other, then that's your overlap. That's what you're looking at. And then you assume that these, these, these sequences are not identical. You assume that they come from different regions. And by the way, this is thinking you'd use if you're building an algorithm. And you assume that neither of these subsequences is a substring of the other. That means that, yes, you may find common regions, but you would say that it's probably not something which is embedded. You, it's like it's probably something which is built on to the end of, you know, the end of one is built on to the beginning of the other. And so the, um, the largest possible overlap is the length of the shorter sequence minus a character, minus one. And that's kind of informally to determine the placement of the largest sequence. But basically, though, you're, you know, the, the placement of the, you know, how the, that's giving you some information about where it was placed. But the thing is, though, that this large, this, this longest possible overlap, is just the, the sequence number, or the number of number of, 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 of characters in that sequence, minus one. So this is really how the algorithm works. I think it's it's um, it looks kind of complicated here, but I think we'll go through it. But really, though, you're starting with these two different sequences, which we'll call like sequence one and sequence two, or S one and S two where n is the size of the smallest sequence and you subtract one from it. That's, a, um, and that's, that's the, the rule here, you subtract one from it. But you're looking at these two sequences above here and you have, for instance, the suffix and the, the prefix. This is like kind of reminding us of, like of maybe going back to grade school English class or language class where the suffix and prefix, the suffix is that chunk of the word that's at the end and the prefix is that chunk of the word which is at the beginning. And in this case, we're looking at the suffix and the prefix of these two different uh, fragments, and we're saying, is there something in common with the end of one word and the beginning of another word? And then if there is, what's the end? Like, how, uh, like what, how, how, how much commonality is there? Maybe I'll just gloss over these rules in a second here, but, but you're, really, you're finding out, you're, you're comparing these two sequences here. And so in, the, in A, for instance, I find out that they're in common, and... Uh, you find out that you have this, uh, this, uh, this overlap. You know what, I just realized it's 11.40, I don't want to keep anyone here, I know that we all have to get on to other classes. Um, tell you what, we'll come back to this on, um, on Friday when we will do this, and there's, um, there's probably also gonna be an, an activity, hint, hint, over this kind of thing because it's just too exciting. But this is, we're looking at right now, <clears throat> the essence of, of where the data comes from. Every time you go to NCBI and do some kind of a an analytical project over genes and things, somebody actually had to go through and to do this. Or to, where is it? Right here. We had to do this work to get everything. And by the way, um, today, when you do this work, just, I'll just give you an idea about how long it takes. It could take you, you could do a, a certain types of genomes that aren't too long, maybe 30,000 bases. I would say you could probably do that in an afternoon or a morning. But in the old days, with old technology, it might take you a month. So the technology has really become quite exciting. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll finish this when I come back um, when we, on, on, the, on, on Friday, uh, so I don't want to keep you guys. It'll just take, there's another discussion here too. So that is it. I will see you all on Friday. Everyone, take some time to go outside, get some air. It is just beautiful outside. I mean, actually, take your computer outside if you have to do your homework and sit on the lawn and be in the sun. <laughs> it's beautiful out there. Everyone, take it easy. I'll see you on Friday. Thank you.